When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Though Satan should buffet, though trial should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and has shed his own blood for my soul it is well soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. My sin, oh the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin not in part, but the whole is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. And Lord, haste the day when my fate shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound, and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. Well, amen. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for today, for all your goodness and your mercy you've shown us. Lord, your mercy truly does endure forever as we come to celebrate the life of our brother, God. I just pray that you'll bless this dear family, Lord. Give them peace today and strength for tomorrow. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, Mr. Colin Meeks, 80 years old, died early Monday morning, May the 30th, at his residence. He was a native of Coffee County but he lived most of his life in Ware County. Colin was employed by Baker Distributing Company for 45 years and retired as a manager of the Waycross location. He was a member of Deanwood Baptist Church, 
where he sang in the choir and volunteered with RAs. Colin was a member of the Ware County JCs, the ASA, and numerous hunting clubs. That gets expensive, doesn't it? Numerous. You said numerous. That's a big deal. Uh, numerous hunting clubs. An avid outdoorsman, he was a founding member of the Okefenokee Bowman Association, and he enjoyed cooking and canning. He and his wife enjoyed traveling the world, including Alaska, Hawaii, Australia, Germany, and Switzerland. Colin was preceded in death by his parents, Warren Kenneth Meeks and Josephine Harper Meeks, and his daughter, Melinda Ann Morgan. Survivors include his wife of 60 years, Miss Loretta Steptoe Meeks of Waycross, two children, Glenn Meeks, uh, Courtney of Hoboken, and Rhonda Sweeney, Ray of Waycross, grandchildren, Taylor Scott Sweeney, Emily, Stuart Sweeney, Daniel, um, Maria Dryden, and James Robson, great-grandchildren, Colin James Sweeney, Madeline and Rebecca Sweeney, Evelyn Ray Sweeney, and a brother, Max Gregory Meeks, and Anna of Douglas, a sister, Sherry Lynn Lieburn of Ponte Vedra, Florida, and numerous nieces and nephews. I'm here today as a product of the goodness of Mr. Colin Meeks. Um, for any other reason, I wouldn't be here today, except for the fact that uh, 30 years ago, he sowed into my life um, in, in ways that, you know, us in the industry, uh, I'm a high vac mechanic. I pastor a church in Slaughterville. And used to, I told people that I was an air conditioned man slash preacher. Now I tell them I'm a preacher slash air conditioned man. So it, one's taken over the other. I got good help, so I get to be more of a preacher today. But 30 years ago, when I began in the heat and air conditioning business, Mr. Collin was there at Baker's, and um, he let me have a line of credit. That was a big deal. If any of you air conditioning guys in the room, that was a big deal back in the day. And uh, he gave me $500 worth of credit so I could use that, and, and he used it pretty fast, if you know what I mean. So I would, I would always go up there, and I'd pay my $500, and I said, I can't wait to the day where I can get ahead and give you $500, and you'll owe me parts. And uh, he said, that ain't going to happen. That's not going to happen. And, uh, but we always had a good time. I always enjoyed it. I, when I first got saved uh, this August, uh, this coming August 30 years ago, I remember going in and for the first time everything was new because I was a Christian. And I had grew up in church. I knew about God. But every, all of a sudden everything was different, man. The spirit of God was living inside me. And, I, you know, I, I was running into these other people that were Christian. And my spirit was bearing witness with theirs. And, man. Life was just golden, and Mr. Collin, he exuded God's peace in those days in my own life, and he was 50 then, and I was just 22 or 3, but I can remember um, talking about church and talking about God and being bold, and, and him, him just the same, and, and not everybody that walks up to the counter there they are Christians, so it was, always, it was always a plus when I could go in and talk to Mr. Collin. Um, Several years ago, I had just started an air conditioning business, and um, I'd, I'd never wanted to borrow money. Uh, to this day, I hadn't thanked the Lord, but I never wanted to borrow money. I kind of wanted to do it as I went. And, uh, you know, most air conditioning guys, if you got a few hand tools and a jug of gas, you're in business. And uh, Mr. Collin always helped me stay out of debt. And um, so I went in one day, and I had a, my fluke meter was bad, my electric meter. I only had one um, back in those days. Now you know to carry three with you, so I had one, so I went in and uh, I had asked Mr. Collin, he sold fluke meters there, and the one I wanted, the 77, if any of you here, it was more expensive, like in, like in 1990, it was expensive, so a couple of hundred dollars back then, and I told Mr. Collin, I said, I said do y'all work on these, he said, yeah, I can send it all for you, I said, okay, so he put it in the box and sat it on top of the counter, and uh, he said, oh, what you going to do about a meter, I said, be careful. Be careful, I guess. That's the only meter I got. So I left. A couple of days later, I come back to get parts. And uh, he come in and said, you, you wouldn't believe what Fluke did. I said, well, what was that? I thought he'd done sent it and they fixed it. He said, no, um, they decided to let us give away a meter. And we drew names and you won. I went. Oh. So, man, I had that new Fluke 77. You know, you put it in front of your tool pouch where you can see it every time, you know when you open your bag. So uh, 
it took me years before I realized that there is no drawing. There was no drawing. I thought I was lucky. There was no drawing. Mr. Collin had bought me a meter to give to me. I have no doubt of that. I can promise you a fluke has never given away a meter. I didn't get one. But he recognized uh, something in me and, and he gave me a gift. And I've never forgotten it. And I've tried to pay that back to young men over the years. And it's because of your husband's love for people that the world's different. I want to read a piece of scripture and I'll be done. Colossians 3 says, If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Most people look past the very first word in that piece of scripture, if, if you're a Christian. And that'd be my goal to you today, is to tell you that um, you, you've not known life until you accept Christ. You, you don't have a clue what it's like until you know Jesus. This August 29th, I'll be saved 30 years. It's like a holiday. I look forward to it. My wife and I were saved the same time. One night at a revival, we both accepted Christ. Our lives have never been the same. I believe that Mr. Collin would have you, have me tell you, that'd be a great way to live your life. And if you're at the end of it, what a great way to finish. The Bible also goes on to say, set your affection on things above, not on things of this earth. The Lord could have had any way for us to transition from this world, this this to heaven. He could anyway. We we could have reached a certain time and we timed out and went to a big place and we was beamed up like Star Trek. That'd be pretty awesome. But that's not how God chose to do it. God chose our bodies to uh, either die by accident or or issues or we time out. We we get old and our bodies begin to break down and we die from natural causes. I almost think that God allows us to grieve as a good thing so that we long and look forward to heaven. The Bible said there in verse 2, to set your affections on things above. Meaning for us to love those things that already that are there, that are over there. Our love, our affections are on things are above. So as Mr. Collins gone today, he was a man's man. As as he's as he's in heaven today, that's where we look forward to going. We could spend hours talking about him, and I won't take all the preacher's words, but I just want to thank you and thank you for being a wife that allowed him to be the man he was. Amen. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. That saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear. And grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear. The hour I first believed. And my chains are gone. I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns. Unending love, amazing grace. The Lord has promised good to me. His word, my hope, secures he will my shield and portion be as long as life endures and my chains are gone i've been set free my god my savior has ransomed me 
And like a flood, his mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. And my chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, his mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. The earth shall soon dissolve like snow, the sun forbear to shine, but God who called me here below will be forever mine, will be forever mine, and you are forever mine. Amen. Thank you, Brother Lee. Thank you for being here. Uh, when I was thinking yesterday about what I wanted to, to share at this service, one of the things I kept thinking was uh, just just how much God had blessed Mr. Collin in his life. I think you mentioned that when I was there yesterday, Mr. Etta. He's uh, 80 years old. Uh, he and Mr. Etta just celebrated a joint birthday back in April, so just a little bit over a month ago. And up until a few months back, had always been very healthy and very active. That is a gift from God. Um, married to Miss Loretta for 60 years, which is not common today. That is a gift from God. Lots of people around him who uh, loved him and cared for him. That's a gift from God. Um, you, you even see, you even see the Lord's mercy in the way that He called Mr. Collin home um, through the sickness He's been going through over the last few months. There was never uh, pain. Um, his his illness didn't linger for months and months. Um, it was all very quick at the end. God, God showed his mercy to Mr. Collin and this family in so many ways uh, over the last few months. Uh, Mr. Collin has been a member of our church family for a while. He predated me here, and I've been here for almost uh, 13 years now. And he has uh, helped with our RAs and sung in the choir, and he was working with Sunday school when I first got here. He was always willing to help in any way that he was needed or in any way that he was asked and uh, when he committed to something, he was, he was fully committed to it. He, he didn't halfway commit. He was very dependable and uh, was all the way in. We talked about that a little bit yesterday. Mr. Collin didn't even, he didn't even dabble at hobbies. When he had a hobby, he was fully committed to the hobby. Uh, so for some of us, when you're barbecuing, you might have your own special recipe you like to use. Mr. Collin uh, made his own barbecue sauce that he bottled and sold. Uh, when he got involved in archery, he got all the way involved in archery. He didn't just make one or two knives. He made thousands and thousands of knives. If, if you're friends with Mr. Collin, you undoubtedly have knives around your house. We counted a number around our house this week that Mr. Collin made and gave away over the years. Um, he was fully committed. He was not the kind of man to halfway be involved in something. So... Uh, we thank the Lord for the kind of man that Mr. Collin was. But I do want to say, our, our hope today as we stand at this service is not in the kind of man Mr. Collin was. Our hope is that Mr. Collin was a man whose trust was in Jesus. And um, there's a passage of scripture that often comes to my mind during times like this. And it's Paul's words in 1 Thessalonians. And I want to read a few of the verses for you. I'm going to read out of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I'm going to start in verse 13 is where Paul writes, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13, he says, I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus 
We shall always be with the Lord. It's what Brother Lee was just singing. He'll be forever ours. And then verse 18, therefore comfort one another with these words. Now what, what strikes me about that passage is that Paul doesn't say as Christians we don't grieve for those who die. The, the difference between believers and non-believers is not that non-believers grieve and Christians don't grieve. Like we're always happy-go-lucky. No, Paul says believers still grieve death. We still grieve Mr. Collins' death. But what Paul says is we don't grieve as those who have no hope. Meaning we, we grieve the death of Mr. Collin, but it's a grief that's mingled with hope because we know that for Christians, the grave doesn't have the last word. Death doesn't win. Uh, maybe my favorite chapter in the whole Bible is uh, Romans chapter 8. And in Romans 8, Paul just elaborates on the blessings that God gives us in Jesus. He elaborates on the promises that God makes to those who believe. And I just want to read three or four verses from this chapter. Romans chapter 8. Here's how he starts the chapter. Paul says in Romans 8.1, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. So th this is the hope we have as Christians. Paul says, if you're in Christ, there's no condemnation. Now, condemnation means to be found guilty by God. It means to be sentenced to judgment by God. And the Bible would say that that's what all of us deserve. Because not only did God make us, but God's told us how he expects us to live. He's given us his law. And God's law gives us the guardrails that God expects us to live our lives within. It's things like worship God alone. Don't worship idols. Don't take God's name in vain. Honor your father and mother. Don't steal. Don't lie. Don't covet. But rather than living our lives in obedience to God, We've all turned our backs on God to do our own thing. Rather than living, bending our knees in submission to God as God, we live our lives as if we're our own little gods. And the Bible would say that because of that, we all stand guilty before God. That, that's why we deserve condemnation. We deserve for God as judge to drop the gavel and find us guilty and sentence us to eternal judgment. So that's the danger that the Bible sets up. Make sure you get that. The danger isn't just death, the danger is dying under condemnation. And that's why what Paul says in Romans 8.1 is such a breathtaking promise. Paul says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. And the reason there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ is because Jesus took our condemnation for us. That's what he was doing at the cross. The cross the cross isn't just a, a grand display of sacrificial love. The cross is Jesus hanging to take the penalty we deserve. It's Jesus being treated as if he committed our sins. It's the judgment we deserve from God being poured out on him. So that now the Bible promises that everyone who gives up living for themselves and puts their faith in Jesus for salvation, the condemnation is taken away. In fact, the way Paul says it is, if you're in Christ, there's no condemnation. And to be in Christ, you're in Christ through faith. So everyone who gives up on living for themselves and puts their trust entirely in Jesus and what he's done for us, the guilt is lifted. The condemnation is removed. Our sins are forgiven. That's, that's the huge hope we have. So the hope we have as believers is when you die with your faith in the Lord, you don't pass through death and stand condemned before God. The condemnation has been removed. Paul continues in Romans 8. Here's another one of the great promises he gives us. Going down to verse 15, Paul says, For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit, that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we also may be glorified together. And then verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Paul, Paul's talking here about the sufferings of this present life. He's saying we're going to have sufferings in this present world. And every single one of us could nod our heads in agreement with that. 
I just mentioned a second ago all of the blessings that God showed Mr. Colin and this family. But that doesn't mean that Mr. Colin didn't know his share of sufferings. Like all of us, he did. He knew what it was to bury loved ones. He knew what it was to go through the travails of chemotherapy. Those are part of the sufferings, Paul saying, of this present life. But here's the promise we have if our faith is in Jesus. Paul says, the sufferings of this present life aren't worthy to be compared to the glory that will be revealed in us. In other words, if you think of it like a scale, it's like Paul saying, if you put the sufferings of this life on one side of the scale and the glory that God has waiting for his people on the other side of the scale, it, it wouldn't even be close. It's like the scale would flip over. The sufferings of this life, in other words, are like, are like they're like a feather compared to the weight of glory that God has waiting for his people. Again, this is why as Christians, we don't grieve without hope. See, we know that if his faith, since his faith was in Christ, Mr. Colin right now is experiencing a weight of glory that is far greater than anything he could have or would have suffered in this life. And then one last promise I want to draw your attention to. It's at the very end of Romans 8. Listen to verses 37 through 39. Paul says, Yet... In all these things we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So get the bookends of Romans 8. Paul starts Romans 8 by saying, if your faith is in Christ, there's no condemnation. And he ends Romans 8 by saying, if your faith is in Christ, nothing can ever separate you from God's love. And then to illustrate or to make that point, Paul goes through this list of things that can't separate you from God's love. So he lists things like height and depth, created things, um, principalities and powers, meaning there's no angel or demon that can separate you from God's love. But what always grabs my attention there is the first thing Paul List mentions on that list. What's the first thing that Paul says can't separate us from God's love? The very first thing he mentions is death. And I think he starts with that because death feels like it separates us from everything. Death separates you from your possessions, it separates from friends, it separates from family. But Paul is making the point that there is one thing, if your faith is in Christ, that death cannot separate you from. Death can't for one second separate a believer from God's love. Which means that here a few days ago, just a few blocks from here, as Mr. Colin slipped toward death. There was not one second during that where he was out of God's grip. There was not one second during that where he was cut off from God's love. So we grieve as Christians, but we don't grieve as those who have no hope. And our hope doesn't rest. Again, Mr. Colin was faithful. Mr. Colin was a good husband and father and grandfather. But our hope doesn't rest on any of Mr. Colin's accomplishments. It rests on a perfect Savior who's accomplished it all for us. And when our faith is in Christ, the judgment that lies on the other side of death is removed. When our faith is in Christ, condemnation is gone. When our faith is in Christ, we're promised that on the other side of the grave isn't judgment. On the other side of the grave is glory. Because we serve a Savior who took our judgment and we serve a Savior who conquered the grave. So we grieve as Christians in hope. Let's pray together. Father, we are thankful that we have a Savior who lived the life that we have failed to live. We have a Savior who took the judgment that we deserve to take. We have a Savior who conquered the grave that's waiting for us all. So, Lord, we're thankful that through Jesus, the fear of death is removed. We're thankful that through Jesus, the Judgment for sin is lifted. We're thankful that through Jesus, the grave now ushers us into eternal glory. It ushers us into our full inheritance. Thank you that you've made us sons and daughters. Thank you that you've made us heirs. And so, Lord, thank you for the hope 
that you give us that weaves its way through our grief as Christians. And Lord, I pray for this family in these days and in the days ahead. I pray, God, as they go through this season of grief, that it would be mingled with hope, that you would remind them of your promises, that you'd remind them of a Savior who has secured eternity for us. And we pray, God, that you would sustain them, that you would show your mercy to them, and that you would show your grace through them. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.